morning, and thank you for joining us for the Living Water broadcast this Sunday morning. We're grateful for all our members and all our guests who are with us today. Um, my name is Theodore Basin, pastor of Living Water Christian Center Church here in East Orange. And on behalf of Pastor Linda and the congregation, we want to welcome you and thank you for being with us. Today we're going to continue our study in Luke chapter 15. Um, we're talking about snapshots of Jesus, looking at Jesus dealing with people, and the parable that he's called, that people like to call the parable of the prodigal son. It's actually a parable of the lost son, but for us we understand there's two lost sons in this, in this um, reading here. All right, so let me go and um, we're going to start at verse 1 again. This is a continuation of our study we call the Lost Boys. Then drew nigh unto him all the publicans and sinners to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So what we have here, we have this parable, which is actually a simple story. Um, used to illustrate a moral or a spiritual lesson or truth. But here we have these two groups of people we talked about last week. We have the, um, the publicans and the sinners. The publicans were tax collectors. And they were hated by the Jews because they were tax collectors working for Rome. So they were considered um, traitors. And they, and they had methods of collecting taxes, we said before, how um, whatever they, method they used or whatever they collected above the tax that was owed, they were able to keep. And they had the backing of Rome, so nobody was going to mess with them. They were going to do what these guys said. Um, Levi, also known as Matthew, was a tax collector. Um, another one that we're familiar with, Zacchaeus, was a tax collector. Okay, And so we had the tax collectors and the sinners. The sinners were the prostitutes. The sinners were the street people. The sinners were people that were not connected to the religious organization. In our, in our today, it would be like those who are outside the church. And then you had the scribes and the Pharisees. The Pharisees were religious leaders, and the scribes were like the lawyers. And, and so we had these religious people who, who claimed to follow the law, and they claimed to do the law of Moses, and they saw themselves as better than the other folks who are outside of the religious organization. And they came to hear Jesus so they could catch him in a fault. The publicans and the sinners came to hear Jesus because they were interested in what he had to say and they were looking for hope. Okay? And so that's what you have here. You have these two groups. That's his audience. And, we, and he goes on and talks about the man with the two sons. And the younger son asked for his inheritance. Okay, in verse 12, it says here that, And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of the goods that befall me. And he divided unto them his living. You need, need to notice something here in verse 12. He didn't just give the young man his portion. He also gave the older son his portion too. It says he divided unto them his living. So he separated what they would have received upon his death and gave it to them early. Okay? Um, in, the, in the culture of the day, the oldest son gets a double portion. So the oldest son would get two-thirds and the younger would get one-third. And that's how it was. And so for, we, for a man of this nature, in this culture, in this time, to divide his living, he would have to sell something. Or he, have to, he would have to divide his, his, um, his crops and his, and his livestock and things like that. So he would have to sell at least one third of that stuff so the young man could get a bag of money and, and be on his way. And of course it says here today, he took his living and he left not many days have, so probably within a week or so, he took off. All right, and went to what's known as a far country. All right, and where it says that he spent his money, he spent his life's lifelong money with riotous living. 
Righteous living means that he spent it on, on sex and, and drinking and drugs and, and gambling and that kind of behavior. Yeah, I did say drugs, didn't I? That's right. Don't you think they were, do you think they weren't getting high back in the day? You know, the poppy plant is native to that area, to the Mediterranean. So um, they no, so they didn't have pills. They weren't popping pills or taking needles, but sure, they was getting high. They was getting high back in Sodom and Gomorrah days. But we're not here to talk about that. Okay? And so the young man, after he spent all his stuff, after he wasted all his living, then comes the famine in the land. Okay, so if if we were in a, a language arts class and the young man was a protagonist, the famine would be an antagonist. The famine would come in there to challenge him and to make things difficult. The famine in the land. And so at this point, there's a famine, which means there's a shortage, a shortage of supplies and food and work and things like that. Just like that we're going through a little shortage now of certain things because of COVID-19. All right, so there's a shortage and the fella cannot find a job and nobody's befriending him. You know, when you, when you have money, you have a lot of friends. You have a lot of people. But when you run out of your money and your substance, your friends run out too. That's just how it is. And so he took a job. He took a job, it says here, feeding swine, feeding pigs. And for a Jew, young Jewish man who's kosher, that's a very difficult thing to do. Okay, so he's taking this job. He's feeding pigs. And he, he even eats what they eat. Now, you have to, now most of us, I don't know if you've been on a farm where they raise pigs and stuff like that. I haven't, so I don't have firsthand knowledge of that thing. But what I do understand, when I was in basic training at Fort Knox, Kentucky, and we was in the mess hall, we had two big garbage cans. One can was for the paper products, you know, the plates, the cups, and the spoons and things like that. And the other can was for edibles. Edibles was the food that you left on your tray. You're really supposed to eat everything. Because they told us, you take all you want, eat all you take. But you know, the food you left on your tray went into this big can. And you put all, you scraped all the food off your tray into this can. And you, you dump the milk in there or whatever drinks you had, you put in this can. And what the army would do, they would take all those edibles, which all that slop and nasty looking stuff looked like vomit, and they would take it to the farms. And they would sell it, I believe they sold it to the farmers. And they would use that to feed pigs. And imagine, imagine a nice Jewish boy who's kosher looking at that stuff and being so hungry that he would eat that. I mean, you and I wouldn't eat that. Some of us would starve first. But look at there. So he has this thing, and so he's, bad, he's about to eat that stuff, and, and then he comes to his mind. Nobody's supporting him, and he come, the Bible said he comes to himself. Okay? He comes to himself. He comes to his right mind, and he says, My father, my father has servants that eat better than this. I'm going to go home. I'll go home and tell my dad that I'm not worthy to be called his son. Make me as one of the servants. Just give me a job. Let me work here for you. I have sinned. I have sinned before God and you. And I, I've just, I've messed up. And he came to himself. And that's an important part in this young man's life. So understand this. He disrespected his father. He showed him no love and no gratitude when he asked for his possessions and run off, okay? He went to a far country. He got way out of touch, and that means that he was, they could not reach him. They did not know where he was, and there was nothing he could do. And so the famine comes, and then there's a shortage, and he's eating pig chow, and then he came to himself. He what, what some of the, um, some of the ministries and some of the, the workers of AA and different, um, recovery program says he bottomed out. You know, sometimes people need to bottom out. Sometimes people need to get to a point where there's nothing else they can do until they just come to themselves and say, oh, this is not where I want to be. I don't want to live like this. I'm going to go get some help. Okay? Um, I have friends and relatives who have been there. I work with men who are in recovery, and this is how they explain it to me. All right, they need help. And when this young man came to himself, 
he decided to go to his father. Okay, and he goes to his father. You know the story. He goes to his father, and the father receives him gladly, gives him a robe, gives him a ring, puts shoes on his feet, have a big feast. Okay, but let's talk about his brother. Now, when the young brother comes home, big brother, who is also lost, who also is disrespectful to his father, who also does not have the same love that he should have for his father in regard to him, he has anger, and he has an anger situation, and he has a problem with superiority. He thinks he's better than his younger brother, but he's just as much a sinner as his younger brother was, but he was lost, what we call being lost in the house. He's home and still lost, okay? And he's resentful to his father. He's resentful to his father because his father received the young man and didn't rebuke him, didn't chastise him, just received him gladly and brought him back and restored everything that he had. And the older brother is upset because he comes in from the field or wherever he is working and he hears the music playing, he hears the celebration, he smells the barbecue, you know, whatever's going on, and he sees people celebrating, and he wants to know what's going on. And so the servants say, hey, your brother is home, and he's safe and sound, and your dad decided to have a celebration for him. And so this man is upset because he's also unforgiving. Here's his problem. His problem is that he worked all this time he served his father and worked, but he's working not because he loved his father, not out of respect and admiration and appreciation. He's serving for a reward. And we have folk in the church like that too. You know, we have folk in the church who are thinking, I'm going to do this because I'm going to get some recognition. I'm going to get some reward when we should be worshiping and serving out of love and gratitude for Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. All right? Yeah, and so, so the brother is upset with his dad. And look what he says in verse 14. I'm not, not verse 14, I'm sorry. In verse, verse 19. Verse 19, the young man says, I am no more worthy to call your son. Make me as one of the hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, and you, you know the story. His father received him, ran to him, kissed him on the neck, and celebrated him. And the young man confessed his faults to his father. Okay? And he says, bring the fatted calf. We're going to celebrate. And verse 25 says, now the elder brother was in the field. And as he came and drew nigh to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked, what, are these what do these things mean? And he said unto him, in verse 27, Thy brother is come, and thy father has killed the fatted calf. That's not just any old cow, yo. That's the fatted calf. That's the, the big one. That's the one that's going to be for special occasions only. Okay? Because he has received him safe and sound. Now you imagine, safe and sound should be enough. My brother was out there, he was lost, and now I got him back. He's safe, he's sound, okay? But look what else. Verse 28, and he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out to entreat him, to talk to him. Imagine, come on now. They, they celebrate, they have a barbecue, they have music playing, there's stuff going on. And, and the young man, the, the big brother comes home, big brother comes home, and he refused to go in to the house or the yard or wherever the celebration is because he's upset. He's not concerned about the little brother. He's not concerned about his dad. He's concerned about himself. He's selfish and unforgiving and judgmental. And he's judging his father right now. He's judging his father for doing these things for the young brother. Okay? For the younger brother. All right? And so his father has to come out and talk to him. And look what dad says to him. Verse 29. And he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgress I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou hast never gave me a kid, that's a young goat, 
that I might make merry with my friends. Are you seeing this? This guy's concerned about himself only and being judgmental and judging his dad. But as soon as thy son was come, which has devoured his thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is yours. You know why all that he has is yours? Because he divided up between the boys. He divided his living. The father divided his living between the two sons, and everything that the father has belongs to the younger son right now. It was fit that we should make merry and be glad, for thy brother was dead, and is alive again, was lost and is found. That is a type of separation. So when the man says your brother was dead, he was not that he was expired or he left his body, but it meant that he was separated. And he was dead. He was out of touch. He was separated out of the fellowship. So in that sense, he was dead. And he was lost and now is found. And so the father said, this is appropriate for us to do. Now listen, um, the big brother has an issue because we said before, he's thinking about himself. What he could have done, and what we need to do, is be true brothers. Remember in the garden, when, when the Lord was looking for Cain, and he, and he says, where's Abel? You know, and Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? The answer, the Lord did not answer him, but the answer is no, but you are his brother, okay? And a true brother should have had compassion, right? A true brother should have been concerned about his brother out in the world and being lost away. He should have been concerned about him. He could have had some kind of hope that he would be okay. He could have said, I need to go find this boy, find my brother, and bring him home. He could have went to his father and said, Dad, let me go get him. I don't know, I think I know where he is. He had to know something because he said he wasted all his money on whores, right? Let me go find him and bring him back. And this is, this is the failure of our church sometime and church folk. We let people go and we don't bring them back. We just wait for the Lord to do the work he's going to do. And Lord, you know where he is. Bring him in. Return him, return him, return him, bring him. And at some point, we as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to go find our brother and our sister and bring them back home. Or at least invite them back. Let them know that they serve a God who forgives everything. Then let them know that God restores and forgives and, and, and builds people up. And they are not out of out of lost completely because Jesus loves them and he died for them and whatever sin they may have commit we um, we're not calling out sins today but whatever thing they may have done or have not done that God has enough power and grace to forgive that thing and restore them to full fellowship and we have to tell people that despite your behavior and what you're doing you're still a son you're still a daughter and you still belong to the Lord. And Jesus Christ is ever making intercession for you. He's the mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And so this is the work of the church. And I understand that, um, you know, and I also talk about this. When, when you don't support people's habits, you don't support their alcoholism, their drug habits, or whatever the habit is, whatever the compulsive behavior is, you don't support it. But even while you're not supporting them, while, I'm not going to give you money for alcohol. I'm sorry, I'm not doing it. Even while you don't support their habit, you still have to reach out to them and say, come on back. Let's get some help. Let's go to the church. Let's go to this program. Let's get the help we need. Let's see the doctor. Let's, let's do the things that's going to make you better. All right? And that's what the big brother should have been doing. He should have said, Dad, let me go find him. I'm worried about the kid. Let me go get him. Let me reach out to him. Let me make the attempt to talk to him. And this is the work of us, y'all. This is our church. This is the work we should be doing. We should be looking out for these people. There's folks out there whom we have not seen in a while, and we need to at least give them a call and see what's going on with you. How can I help you? Why don't you come back? 
you know, Jesus loves you. We love you too. And we want you to be restored. So this is the work of the big brother. We should be looking for our uh, lost brothers and sisters who are separated from us. And some of them may not be in a bad way, but we need to find out how they're, how they're doing and what's going on. All right? So here's the story. You got these two sons, and they're both lost. One, they, they both disrespect their father. They both are unappreciative of their situation. They're both wrong. Both of them are wrong. And just, you have the audience that Jesus is talking to. You've got two groups of people. You have the sinners, publicans and sinners, who are sinners, and they know they're sinners. Right? And you have the religious community, who are sinners and don't know it. Because they attend the services, they do the rituals, they go through the steps, they do the things, and they think they are okay. And they think they don't need help. But Jesus is here to let them know they do need help. Those, those two groups of people, they need help. And we don't want to be like the, fact, the scribes and the Pharisees, church folk. We don't want to be like them. We want to understand and remember that we are saved by grace. That is only because of the mercy and grace and the power of Jesus Christ that we have this great salvation. And that we're not better than anybody. We're just in a better position. Okay? And every day, we are dependent on the Lord to live this thing out. And every day, we are thankful. We should be thankful. We need to appreciate what the Father has bestowed upon us. It says, you know, the Bible says, it says, what man or love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Right? And it says that the world does not recognize us because it doesn't recognize him. And now are we the sons of God and does not yet appear where we shall be, but when he appears, we shall be just like him. We're going to see him as he is. We have to understand, we have not done anything to earn that. <laughs> we don't deserve it. We have not earned it. We don't deserve it. We could have paid for it. We cannot achieve that thing. That was all by the mercy and grace of the God that we serve and the blood of Jesus Christ's life. Okay? So, let's remember that. Let's not be a Pharisee. Okay? Let's not be like them. Don't be lost in the house, in church, going to church and still lost because you haven't come to full repentance. Our, all the, it's the desire of the Lord that nobody perish, but that everybody repents. And if you repented already, God bless you. You're in a better position than those folks who don't think they need to repent. All right, so we got the two groups. We got the sinners, sinners, all right? And we got the church folk. And what we need to do is understand something. Bring the sinners to church with you. I wish we was in the house together today. And what we need to do, we have a, we need to bring sinners, so-called sinners, the unrepentant, the unchurched, we need to bring them to the church with us so they can meet Jesus. All right? And that's what we need to do. And we need, and we who are already in church, we need to remind ourselves who we were and what we used to be like. And be grateful every day that the Lord has bestowed his grace and mercy upon us to save our very soul. You know what? If we got what we deserve, we all go to hell. Without exception. Because there's no, no one righteous. No, not one. Not one of us is righteous outside of Jesus Christ. But Jesus himself became sin that you and I could become the righteousness of God in him. And Jesus Christ is where all our righteousness is. So don't go around, you know, being superior to anybody and think you're better than anybody. Come on, say, you can't do that because you're only there because of what Jesus has done for you. And if the next person except Jesus Christ He's just as good, he or she is in the same position that you're in, saved by the grace of God. Amen? So, when you look at the parable of the so-called parable of the prodigal son, look at both sons and look at the father. There's one writer that says the real, parable, the real prodigal in the story is the dad. Because he's the one that divided his living and basically gave it away, all right? Knowing his sons 
and knowing that the young man was going to go wasted. So he's the real prodigal in the story. Oh, by the way, prodigal means uh, waste, the one who wasteful, wasteful living, that kind of thing. Okay? So, we want you to understand this thing. Two groups, two situations, and both of them are lost. If you're lost today, you can be found just by saying, yes, Lord. Because it's the God that seeks out people. If you look at the whole chapter in the beginning, the shepherd lost the sheep, the shepherd went and found the sheep. The woman lost the coin, the woman cleaned her house, turned on the lights, and found the coin. In the lost son, nobody went to find him. He had to come to himself. What should have happened, the brother, the other brother should have went to find that young man. Let's not be like that man. Let's be the true brother and true sister, okay? And let's go and reach out and find the people that we think are lost, okay? And if you're lost, or if you think you're lost, or if you're not sure, it's just a matter of coming to faith in Jesus Christ and trusting him. Just for the asking, he saves, he heals, he delivers. Just for the asking. There's no special formula. All you got to do is say, Lord Jesus, I come into my life. I need you. Right? The young man in the story said, I sin. All of us have sinned. He said, I sin. I'm not worthy. Don't worry about that. Just say, don't worry about trying to clean stuff up. We said this before. Don't worry about trying to put this aside and put that aside and clean this up. Oh, don't worry about leaving. The, no, don't worry about any of that stuff. Just work, work right where you are. When you make that decision with whatever you have with you, come to Jesus, bring it with you. If you have issues, bring issues with you. If you have anxieties and fear, bring that with you. If you have, um, if you have all these attachments, if you have um, all kind of uh, addictions and things, bring everything with you to Jesus. Bring everything you have with you to Jesus. He will work with you, with what you got. And he will save you despite those things that you have or despite what you've been through. Whatever it is, just come to Jesus with it and he will save you where, right where you are, right when you say, yes, Lord, when you trust in him, you will be saved this day. You'll be like the thief on the cross that died next to Jesus. And Jesus said, today you shall be with me in paradise. And right away you'll be saved. You don't have to wait for certain things and steps and things and you know it's not a still twelve step ooh, excuse me not a twelve step program salvation comes at the moment you trust in the Lord amen let us pray Father we thank you for being our God and our Father we thank you for hearing our prayers we thank you for your word we thank you for the lesson we thank you for allowing us this great salvation Lord and we who recognize that we need you, we reach out to you in faith right now, and we say thank you, Lord, because you have saved us and you have secured us. And do it for the brothers and sisters who are listening, and those who want you right now, Lord, we know that you receive them by faith. If they trust you, they belong to you. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Do these things, Lord, and let us know, Father, how they're doing, that we as a church could support their decision to come to you. We thank you for what you're doing and we bless your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you so much. We thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we'll be back again next week and we're grateful for this time spent with us today. God bless you. We love you. We miss you. Thank you. <laughs>